we're really excited to have Jan uh, follow up on the two hour hug your baby training. She's gonna spend some time with us this morning um, going over the resources and going over some case studies and scenarios with us. So I'll turn it over to Jan. Great, well, it's so wonderful to be with you this morning. And I, I am gonna keep glancing to the right because I'm uh, we're admitting a few people who we just have about 10 more that we're expecting. So um, we'll move right along. But I like to start by saying, this is what the babies in your state are feeling this morning. They are so excited that you are gonna be giving them a big hug. And I'm very excited along with them. Um, I want you to know that you are joining a, a big group of uh, WIC people around the country now. We, uh, uh, Michigan is now the 10th of the um, uh, states that have begun using statewide Hug Your Baby training. And so I'm, I'm excited that that's the case. And I'm also uh, counting on y'all to continue to give me advice and ideas about ways to um, improve our program and to share it more broadly with other states. So if you have a best friend who works for WIC in another state, let me know about it. We'll be in touch with them too. Um, but the other thing I want you to know is that today you are joining a larger worldwide Hug Your Baby community. Hug Your Baby has uh, been used and um, the resources and training in 50 states and country and 50 countries around the world and tribal nations. And uh, we have over 300 Hug Your Baby uh, certified hug teachers around the world and a half dozen trainers in different countries. So you now are we are excited to invite you into this broader Hug Your Baby community. And we do have twice a year or three times a year an, an international Hug Your Baby meeting. And I'll be letting Margie know about that so she can extend that uh, invitation to you. It's, it's really a fun, uh, exciting time to meet with people around the world that care a lot about babies and their parents and also want to know about how babies um, development impacts the breastfeeding experience. So let's start by thinking of some of the families that you may actually be seeing in your practice. How about this mom who says, why won't you look at me? You must not love me or love my breast milk. Or how about this mother who says, my baby wiggles and squirms off and on all night long. Let's add some cereal to my breast milk. I know you've all heard that. And what about this daddy? She cries more now this week that she's two weeks old than she did last week. It must be time to add formula. I know that these are real life stories of real patients, the kind of mommies and daddies that you work with. And those are the, the issues we're gonna be thinking about together today. One thing I do want to say, you have sort of an extra bonus for joining us today. If you stay for the entire class today, uh, um, Margie and I will be sending you a, um, a certificate for an extra hour of SERP credit. So. Oh. Yeah, let's see. Oops, somebody was unmuted there. Let's let's think about um, the what's uh, what's uh, families are facing today, and we all know that being a new parent is a challenge, even in the the best of times. And certainly, most of us have experienced that these times of the pandemic have not been the best of times. For instance, we know that postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression are really on the rise in really substantial ways during the pandemic. And there are many reasons for that, financial, social, uh, people losing their jobs, people not being able to get out and get the love and support even from family members that they won't. But we also know that that families continuing to not understand their baby's behavior, especially if they're feeling kind of isolated from the kind of support that they would want, really contributes to their anxiety and depression. So what is it that today's parents want? Well, they want you to be helping them think about their baby. They don't want to feel like you're just giving them the same old 
um, ideas and information you give to just anybody. They want to feel that you are customizing uh, the information you're presenting in a way that makes them feel like you're hearing from them about their needs. Of course, they want that information to be evidence-based because as we know, every one of those mamas is going to Google everything you tell them to make sure you told them right. So they want that information to be evidence-based we also know that we need to give information that will address various learning styles. Some people are very comfortable reading a brochure. Others are not. Others are visual learners. Others learn by music. Others learn by the written word. So we need to provide information that addresses that um, uh, those different learning styles and, in fact, is available 24-7 because these mothers are up in the middle of the night with these babies. So what we're going to be thinking about today is how does the child development, the pediatric, and the lactation literature inform us about the needs and uh, concerns of the families you serve. So let's think about um, beginning with the child development literature. And I am just so excited about the literature that falls under the umbrella of what we call responsive parenting. So what is responsive parenting? Well, the World Health Organization lets us know that responsive parenting is a parent's ability to first notice a baby's behavior. Once they notice the behavior, then they have to be able to understand that behavior and interpret it correctly. And then they can take actions that benefit them and benefit the baby. So for instance, thinking back on those three mamas and daddies we met earlier today, that mother that says, why won't you look at me? You must not love me or love my milk. Well, she was in fact noticing a baby's behavior, but she was misinterpreting that as rejection from her baby instead of understanding that that was normal newborn behavior that we'll talk about in a minute, a baby sending out an SOS. Or that daddy who says, my two-week-old is crying more now than last week. He must need some formula. Let's, let's add some formula instead of all this breast milk. Well, again, he was noticing a baby's behavior, but he was misinterpreting that behavior as a breastfeeding problem instead of understanding that that was the normal behavior of a two-week-old. So I know that these are the kinds of issues you hear from your families. Let's think a minute about the importance of responsive parenting. And what we know is that when parents respond appropriately to their little babies, that becomes the core of that emotional, intellectual, and social development that we know is so critically important. And the research is so profound now that we know that if a family practices uh, responsive parenting, that there is decreased postpartum depression, increased confidence oh, both in the mother and, your and the father. By pound. Uh oh, we got somebody's. Uh, everybody, check to make sure they're muted, please. Thank you. Uh, we also know that responsive parenting contributes to increased breastfeeding duration, less family stress. Enter your participant ID followed by pound. And even that there is a lower obesity as those children you are in the meeting now. There are more than. <laughs> Let's see. All right. Now, you guys mute yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and what we also know to be the case, which I'm sure you're aware of, is that responsive parenting is critical to breastfeeding. A mother has to be able to learn to read those feeding cues in order to successfully breastfeed. But what's interesting that the literature also shares that a mother who is breastfeeding, actually the breastfeeding activities itself teaches the mother to be more responsive. So those who study responsive parenting in an older child um, see that the parent is actually more responsive to that child, possibly because of that breastfeeding experience. 
So now let's turn to the uh, pediatric literature. And this is my mentor, Dr. T. Barry Brazelton. He uh, just passed away a few years ago. He was a, a fabulous um, Harvard uh, pediatrician. And I'm sure many of you know of his work. And I had the great honor to to study with him and do some training with him over the years. And his contributions were very broad into the world of um, pediatrics and child development. But one thing he taught us in that world is that the neonatal behavioral assessment scale helps us look really closely at a baby's behavior, particularly what the typical literature he calls a newborn states, which hug your baby causes the newborn zones, and a baby's stress response, which as you know, in hug your baby, we refer to that as the, the baby sending out an SOS, sign of overstimulation. So let's think a bit about his second body of literature called the touch points, the Brazelton touch points. And we, I talked about, a bit about this in the two hour class that you guys um, watched. And what we understand is that there is a change in a baby's behavior right when the baby is learning something new. Right when there is a surge in her development, it causes a change in her behavior. So let me ask a question. We're gonna um, have our first uh, poll question here. Uh, I think, uh, can y'all see that poll now? Yeah, okay, so let's see. Answer this question for me. A surge in baby's development, does it cause an improvement in baby's eating, sleeping, or general behavior? Or does it call a disorganization in baby's behavior? This is really important because babies will continue to have surges and changes in their development for many, many years ahead. And for a parent to understand this very critical and important um, developmental theory is exceedingly important. So gosh, I'm so excited. 94% of you knew that um, a surge in a baby's development causes some temporary disorganization in the baby's eating, sleeping, or general behavior. And you know, it's a lot like you and me. For instance, if you get a, um, get a new job, the first week or two you go to your new job, you may find that your appetite is a little off and you don't sleep quite as well. A surge in your own development might cause you to um, have some changes in your, in your behavior. So we know that these little babies have a, a disorganization, a temporary disorganization in their eating, sleeping, and general behavior. And the reason we want your families to know this from the beginning is whenever they feel like, I don't understand my baby, I don't understand how my baby's behaving, we don't want the first th thing for them to think of, oh, it must be my breast milk, I better stop breastfeeding. We want the first thing for them to think about, how is my baby changing? How is my baby growing and developing right now that might be impacting her development? And the good news is we know when these developmental surges occur, they are predictable. And as you know, from the course you took, we can um, give families important information about those changes. So what is the lactation literature? Well, the lactation literature has a lot of things to teach us, but I'm particularly fond of the infant feeding and practice study Study two. This study that was done a number of years ago, but has continued to be analyzed and analyzed over and over again, because it asks the questions, why do women uh, stop breastfeeding and when do women stop breastfeeding? And certainly this mother with her two week old may stop breastfeeding if she has cracked and bleeding nipples. This mother with a four month old who's on a nursing strike she might stop breastfeeding because she doesn't understand that behavior. Or this mother with a nine month old who's just started having separation anxiety, waking up more at night and the mother says, oh, it must be my breast milk's not strong enough anymore. All of these are reasons that a mother could stop breastfeeding if she doesn't 
get the kind of help from you to understand that baby's behavior that she needs. But what we also know is that at each of these times, the mother said, you know, my baby just seems unsatisfied, irritable, not herself. And I think that really connects well with what we talked about from the Brazelton theory that as, as a baby is changing in her development, it can make the baby temporarily out of sorts and not herself. So what we know to be the case is this big Cochrane study helped us understand this. If you sit around and wait for the phone to ring with your mother misunderstanding this behavior, you might have waited too long. All of us know we've had that experience where they, we get that phone call. Oh, I, my baby didn't seem happy. So two weeks ago, I, uh, I stopped breastfeeding and now I have some mastitis. Can you tell me what to do for my mastitis? <laughs> well, you know, that's not the phone call we want to get. We want to get that phone call. My baby's acting funny. I don't understand. Help me understand my baby. And so this idea about anticipatory guidance, helping parents ahead of time know how their baby's going to grow and change, led to the development of the roadmap to breastfeeding success. And we're going to talk about that specifically today. So let's imagine this little scenario. It's four o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and a mother with a four-month-old calls and says, I'm so worried. I think my baby wants to wean. She explains that every time the baby goes on the breast, she'll pull off the breast and look all around the room. Do you think that means she wants to wean? So I'm excited that this mother called you with this question because she trusts you and she knows that you understand more about breastfeeding than just the nipple, the latch and the breast that you also understand about a baby's behavior. So these ideas during the pandemic caused me to develop uh, a new resource that I'm now making available to Michigan WIC and to WIC programs all over the country, where we pull together the resources that Hug Your Babies developed over about 20 years now that helps parents understand their babies growing, developing, growing in development, and also to understand the impact on the breastfeeding experience. So we are looking now at the Michigan WIC parent resource page. Um, the, all of the materials are both in English and Spanish, and you need to understand this is free for your parents. Um, uh, Michigan WIC has made this available for you so that you can really get to know this material and you can share this resource with all of your Michigan WIC families. So the beginning part of the top of the page is the Hug Your Baby 20-Minute Parent Education video that talks about helping a parent understand and care for their newborn. And our recommendation is that you get all of your pregnant families to watch this video. So they can just go from their living room at home, they can turn on their computer, go to this web page and watch this 20 minute video in English and in Spanish. So while they've still got their wits about them, while they're still pregnant, they can come to understand their baby's behavior. And then if they don't see it then, or many of them will say, now that I'm, I've got my baby here, I want to go back and look at that video again, because now I understand the kind of questions I have. Then if you pull down the page, the next thing you'll see is our handout, Understanding and Caring for Your Newborn, because some families are word people. They learn better reading and they like to have sort of a summary of what they just watched on a video. So they can either download this um, handout or read it online. And then as you come down the page, what we get to next is what, of course, I'm most excited about, our roadmap to breastfeeding success, again, in both English and Spanish. And then below the picture of the roadmap, you're going to see all of these bullet points. And what we've done is we've created a little short one to two minute video about each of these times during that first year of a baby's life. So at so when they are 
thinking about the prenatal experience, they can click on the prenatal. When they are talking about that two-week-old that's crying too much, they can click on the two-week-old. And this is a way that you'll be able to refer patients to um, information that really meets their specific interests and needs. Coming on down the page, we have the Hug Your Baby newsletters. And I think this is really important because, you know, one way that we feel supported as a new family with a new baby is to know that we are not alone, that other people have that experience too. So for instance, when we think about this family who was having confused about a, a one month old sleep cycle and um, her peer counselor referred her to the uh, Michigan page and said, read that story about the one month old. And when she turned on it, she was able to click on the video and learn about those two kinds of sleep. And then she was able to read a family story, a really lovely family that was working so hard to understand their baby, but said, help, my baby won't sleep through the night. And how understanding that baby's uh, active and deep sleep help this parent, these parents get a better night's sleep for their baby and for themselves. And then at the bottom of the page, what we have is the Hug Your Baby lullabies. And my husband's a professional musician. And while we traveled internationally, we wrote lullabies that teach about child development. And we're going to see a couple of those lullabies today. So let's, uh, let's pretend we're one of these uh, seagulls, we're going to take a bird's eye view of the Hug Your Baby materials and think about um, how you can use these materials to support the families you serve. It's kind of a lot of information to cover in an hour, but um, I think it's important, so we'll take time to do most of this today. So here's, here's Brittany. She comes to you and she says, well, I don't really think breastfeeding's for me. I, I mean, I, I just don't really understand why I need to bother to breastfeed. But you remember on your roadmap, uh, on your digital page that there's a, uh, in red there it says, why choose to breastfeed? And you refer your mama to that. And this is what she learns. As this baby knows, breastfeeding is best for the baby, for the mother, and for her family. But breastfeeding is a very personal decision. Understanding your reasons to breastfeed will motivate you to take all the steps necessary to meet your breastfeeding goals. Which of these benefits of breastfeeding are most important to you and your family? Research confirms that breastfeeding hormones will enhance the bonding experience, help you feel closer to your baby, and decrease postpartum depression. In addition, breastfeeding strengthens your baby's immune system, helps prevent childhood illnesses such as respiratory infections and gastroenteritis, and decreases the risks of lifelong illnesses such as asthma, obesity, and diabetes in your baby. Mothers who breastfeed have decreased breast and ovarian cancer, less cardiovascular disease, and a lower risk for diabetes. They even lose their pregnancy weight more easily. Families with a breastfeeding baby are less sick and miss less work than do families with formula-fed babies. Breastfeeding families have fewer medical expenses and save money by not buying formula. Though babies and mothers benefit from any breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding until six months significantly increases all these benefits. And of course, that mother will be so happy that you have put together that information in a way that she can understand. And then you would have, would most likely say, well, when you, when you learned about those benefits of breastfeeding, what was most important to you? And she might say, well, you know, my mother had breast cancer. So if, you know, if, if breastfeeding can decrease my risk of getting breast cancer, my goodness, I really want to do that because we always want to personalize that information. And then another mother might say, you know, I worry I won't understand my baby. And then what you want her to know is about those predictable bumps in the road that Dr. Brasselton's touch points helped us understand. Breastfeeding is an exciting journey for you and your baby. But like with any great journey, there can be some bumps in the road. This roadmap will alert you when your baby's surge in development might cause a change in her behavior. Just as baby is about to jump from one stage of development to the next, like from sitting to crawling, she might temporarily be distracted while breastfeeding, 
wake up more at night, or be a bit grumpy when she works to learn something new. These temporary challenges can be celebrated as proof that she is developing normally. Click on or download the roadmap for tips on how to navigate these important bumps in the road. Again, you've, you're preparing that mother ahead of time, empowering her. And of course, what, what, one thing the lactation literature teaches us is where the mother feels more confident that that is one of the key factors to her meeting her breastfeeding goals. Now, what about during that prenatal period? I know that there is so much information you want to give them during the prenatal period. You want them to think about why do you want to breastfeed? Where is the support you need? And can you read your baby's body language? And so, again, we've put this together in a way that will help you explain this. And you learned in your uh, online course about reading a baby's zones and SOSs. Let's jump into another poll here and see who can remember what those newborn uh, zones, what the name of those newborn zones are here. Help me out with this question. There are three newborn zones. What are the names of these zones? The resting ready and the relaxing zone, the resting ready and the rebooting zone, or the relaxing, the ready, and the renewing zone? How about that for a fun question? Oh yes, you've done your homework. This is exciting. It looks like almost all of you understood that um, Hug Your Baby refers to these as the resting, the ready, and the rebooting zone. That's right, great. And again, the reason we use this language is this is language that parents are familiar with. They know, they understand the word resting, ready, and rebooting. And so there really is exciting research that when we give families language that they can understand, we're kind of meeting them at their language whether than in, rather than ex insisting that they kind of come over to our medicalized language. When we give them language to understand their baby, it really enhances their ability to see that behavior in their baby. Of course, what I hear, they hear these babies are demonstrating these zones. We've all bumped into that rebooting zone, haven't we? Now, of course, we don't like to refer to a physiologic stress response as the medical literature does. We want to talk about a baby sending out an SOS. And we remember this mother, oh no, my baby won't look at me. But what this baby is really demonstrating is she's sending out an SOS. So let's remember those types of SOSs. The first way babies send out an SOS is with changes in their body skin color, movement, and breathing. This baby, who was born a few weeks early, shows these body SOSs. See how his face turns a bit red in color? His muscles jerk and shake, and his breathing gets faster. The second way babies send out an SOS is with changes in their behavior. Spacing out, switching off, and shutting down. Watch as Jan plays with the baby by shaking a rattle. The baby begins to look like she is staring into space. Spacing out is a sign of overstimulation. This baby demonstrates the second behavioral SOS, switching off, described in the medical literature as gaze aversion. The harder the mother tries to get the baby's attention, the more the baby looks the other way. This switching off is a sign that the baby is trying to manage the amount of stimulation she takes in. Mothers are relieved to learn what this behavior means and that it is not a sign that the baby is rejecting her. This baby demonstrates the third behavioral SOS, shutting down. Again, we see Jan playing with the baby. Though the baby is momentarily engaged with this play, she soon begins to get drowsy and shuts down as a response to too much stimulation. You can respond to an SOS by decreasing stimulation and increasing support of your baby. Decrease stimulation by speaking quietly to the overstimulated baby. Increase support by holding your baby's hands against his chest or gently swaying him. Putting your baby skin to skin or breastfeeding him will also decrease that SOS. 
And of course, one thing we know about babies, if parents misunderstand the SOS, babies can get really more and more upset and increase crying, which is even more stressful to a family. Now meet my little friend, Olivia here. She uh, came to our um, breastfeeding class. She was a teenager with a, a mother who did not breastfeed her baby. Um, she was also um, uh, a, a young a teenager whose boyfriend was uninvolved in the care of the baby. And then finally, her baby was born early. So she had an early baby. With all those risk, uh, risk factors, we would not expect her to be successful breastfeeding. But she was. And she um, wanted to share with us how understanding her baby's behavior was so important to her. I thought it was really special the way that Carson communicated to us mm -hmm. as a tiny little baby. And I wondered if you would share a little bit about what, uh, how you learned to read his body language and what that meant to you. Yes, when we were talking, you were showing me some of the little mm -hmm. signs, like him squinting, squinting his eyes and him like uh, moving his arms wildly and his legs. That means that he's been overstimulated. Uh -huh. So we tried different things, like putting his arms close to his chest and swaddling him and rocking him back and forth and that seemed to help and you can tell the difference between when he's being overstimulated versus when he's just closing his eyes and being calm yeah yes. i remember i love that when we talked about this you you said you were going to teach your sister and your mom and so y'all all were yes paying so so much attention to these little ways that babies communicate That's yes great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. babies are very smart smarter than what we think they are don't we love the fact that this teenager felt so empowered by this information that she was going to teach her mother and her sisters about this? Um, um, this was a video 10 years ago. You might can tell from our hairdos. But anyway, uh, two months ago, I got an email from this mother and she had gone off to community college, had started a group there for teenage moms while she was in community college, and now is the executive director at one of the social services um, programs um, at a big uh, local university. So you just never know the long-term impact of empowering our families uh, to meet their parenting and breastfeeding goals. Um, I, I see on the chat here that a, a couple of you felt like your poll questions were not getting through to me. It looked to me like most of them were coming through, but not to worry if we're having a little develop a little developmental glitch, we won't worry about it. We appreciate you participating as best you can. So how about this mom? This mom, she says, you know, um, I missed my breastfeeding class and I'm so worried now, I won't know what to do. Well, we can say again that we've got this material all ready for you under that birth um, uh, section. How can you tell if your baby is hungry and is getting enough to eat? And what uh, what is the normal amount of stools that a baby has? I love your baby this can part be your of greatest video. teacher. Watching for early signs of hunger and keeping track of baby's wet diapers and of the number and color of baby's stools will reassure you that your baby is getting plenty to eat. And we, you know, the video does go on to show about the early feeding cues and give very specific information about how you can tell that your baby is getting enough to eat. So that gets us to this birth section. And let's see what this family gets to learn about. Congratulations, your baby is here. These next few days are filled with wonder and joy and a bit of normal and healthy worry. Now is the time to take important steps to make sure you meet your breastfeeding goals. On day one and two, mother's first milk, colostrum, contains important bodybuilding proteins and antibodies to fight infection. Since a newborn's stomach is the size of a marble, he eats only about a teaspoon or five milliliters at each feeding. Fortunately, colostrum is very concentrated and perfect for your newborn. Most babies experience cluster feeding on day two. They want to eat more frequently when mother's milk is about to change from colostrum to more mature milk. Putting baby frequently to the breast will both calm the baby and build up mother's milk supply. By day three, baby's stomach increases from the size of a marble to the size of a table tennis ball. Now baby can eat one ounce, which is about 30 milliliters at a time. Feedings will occur about every three hours or so. However, like most adults, baby may be hungrier or less hungry at different times of the day. Most babies need to breastfeed 8 to 10 times in 24 hours. 
A newborn has special ways to communicate that she is hungry. She might bring her hand up to her mouth, smack her lips, or wiggle and squirm like this when she is ready to eat. Early swaddling or pacifier use makes it harder for the baby to communicate those important early signs of hunger. Therefore, most professionals recommend delaying swaddling, pacifier use, and feeding with a bottle until breastfeeding is well established at about two weeks of age. Bringing baby immediately to the breast after birth, practicing lots of skin-to-skin -skin time, and providing only breast milk unless you have a medical problem to address will increase your milk production and help you build a good milk supply. Family, friends, and professionals are here to help you on your breastfeeding journey. But remember, your baby can be your greatest teacher. Watching for early signs of hunger and keeping track of baby's wet diapers and of the number and color of baby's stools will reassure you that your baby is getting plenty to eat. Contact your medical provider or a lactation specialist if you have any breastfeeding concerns when you get home. Now, I can imagine that Carla, one of your uh, families, uh, one of your mothers that you followed during her pregnancy, she, she calls you um, this afternoon and says, oh, you know, my due date is next week. And, and I came to your breastfeeding class, but I'm so afraid I won't remember what I really need to know. So you can say not to worry. Let's look at the, the, uh, the resource page together and just click on that little birth section and that will remind you about your baby's feeding cues and about following your baby's pees and poops as a way of knowing that the baby's getting enough to eat. All right, now we got daddy. Remember he was here at the beginning of the class. Our two week old baby's crying more now. Is it time for formula? And again, we're really happy that Jose is asking these questions before they add formula in the family. And what we know is that if families are not able to manage crying, if they don't have information and ideas about how to help a crying baby, they are more likely to add formula, begin solids prematurely, abandon, give up breastfeeding altogether, and or have postpartum depression. So that's why at the two week time period on the roadmap, we remind you, so you can remind your families that babies have a normal increase in crying. This seems to be the case all over the world in all races and ethnicities, that at, at about at two weeks after their due date, a little increase of crying, and then tapers off over a number of weeks. Some babies, this is just a very slight increase in crying and families don't notice. Other families will say it was like a switch went off and my baby all of a sudden was fussing more. And so what we want to know, I want them to know, is we want to give them the skills, uh, the specific techniques to help a crying baby. And so there is a, a video um, on the two week section about those techniques, but I thought this would be also be a fun time where we could look at the Korean inspired lullaby that in, um, enhances a daddy's ability to calm their baby. And I think it's really empowering for a father, a partner to be able to say, this is something I'm gonna really get good at. My daddy knows how to help When I've lost my way He holds my hands to my chest Softly calling my name Sometimes I feel so Sweet love 
the reason we uh, wrote this lullaby is that the literature is really clear that when we empower partners, uh, spouses to uh, support breastfeeding, to have the information they need to breastfeed, that the mother is more likely to meet her breastfeeding goals. Okay, let's move along here. Now we are thinking about that one month old. What is so important for the families to understand about a month, a one month old? And this is the kind of story, an oh no story you might hear. I would wake up every time he made a whimper at night thinking he needed to breastfeed. I just was exhausted. I didn't get any more than an hour of sleep at a time, and that was oh, a maximum. Real. He seemed frustrated. I seemed frustrated. We're both mm -hmm. crying in the middle of the night. Yes. So I'm wondering, let's uh, y'all jump on with your chat and give me your, your thoughts about this. Does misunderstanding active sleep cause mothers to stop breastfeeding? What do you think about that? If, if it's, have you bumped into families misunderstanding, not knowing about active and deep sleep? Oh my, I'm getting a whole string of yeses here all the time. Yes, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Um, yes, you know, I, honestly, when I'm teaching my uh, newborn class, I said, well, if you've uh, been sleeping through the first part of the class, wake up for this part because you're going to really want to know this. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and one, uh, one of our counselors here said that, yes, they think they have a low milk supply. So that is why we want them to understand this normal behavior and that it's not a sign of um, a low milk supply. And so what we want them to know that normal healthy babies have spend more time in active light sleep than in still deep sleep. And of course, if you use those words with a family, they may not know what you're talking about. So we want to refer them to that one month um, episode on the roadmap. And this is what they'll be able to see the difference between active light and still deep sleep. This baby shows us what still deep sleep looks like. Her body is still. She surprises her mother by not responding to any stimulation. There is no movement of her eyes and her eyelids stay shut. Her breathing is deep and regular and she makes no sounds. Every hour or so, a newborn will transition from this still deep sleep to active light sleep. This baby is in active light sleep. Her eyes might flash open. She puckers her mouth, makes sucking movements, vocalizes, and can even smile. But this baby is not waking up. She is just transitioning from her still deep sleep to her active light sleep. In only a few minutes, we observe that she transitions back to still deep sleep. And I think all of us would agree that if we saw that squirmy, wiggly, grunting baby, we may think that baby is waking up. But by one month old, a mother can sit and watch that baby a few minutes and see does that baby settle back down into deep sleep. And when that occurs, then the parents are actually helping that baby learn more self-regulation so that the baby will be able then to extend their breastfeeding periods. So eating every three hours, every four hours, every five hours, because during that time, they are gonna transition from that active sleep to deep sleep, to active sleep, to deep sleep again. And just to remind you that the one month period, and this is on the roadmap too, that the mothers have a change in the protein in their breast milk, starting at between four and six weeks. When they are young, um, uh, less than one month old, mother's milk has more of the whey protein. But by the time they get to be one month old, their, their milk has equal whey and casein protein. And so what that results in is that the baby has less poops. This is when we see the baby having one poop a day or one poop every three days. And the mother, if she doesn't understand this, may think, oh my gosh, my baby's supposed to have six poops a day like he was, like he did when he was two weeks old. 
but now he's only having um, one poop a day. So again, we want him to understand ahead of time that this is normal. And so certainly people will be turning to work at, at, at different times. I'm thinking of Lakeisha here who came to you and said, you know what? How will I ever be able to make this happen? Returning to work and being uh, a breastfeeding mother. And so we, the part of the video there, um, we're going to look just at the end part of it because one thing that happens uh, at around that three month period is we start to see what is called some sleep regression. And this is actually one of those bumps in the road where the baby is distracted uh, by their own, um, by the world around them so that they start pulling off the breast. And if the mother doesn't understand it and tries to force the baby to breastfeed, then the baby may refuse the breast altogether and have what we call a nursing strike. I'm just putting together a new online course about nursing strike and have a professional article going off to publication about this subject so we can provide more information on this in the future if you'd like. Just one additional thought. The Bumps in the Road video explains that a surge in baby's development can impact baby's eating and sleeping patterns. Similarly, a change in baby's routine may cause a temporary regression in her sleeping and eating. Occasionally, a baby will respond to these changes in routine by suddenly acting like she doesn't want to breastfeed. This behavior is sometimes called a nursing strike. Know that your baby is not trying to wean. She is just expressing her confusion about these family changes. A local lactation specialist can give you advice about how to manage this bump in the road so that you can continue breastfeeding successfully. Okay, so we're up to four months now, and we may be remembering that uh, family that called you, <coughs> excuse me, with that four month old. <coughs> Goodness, springtime's here, huh? Um, why do you do you think she wants to wean? This mother is saying, "Oh no, this baby's not wanting to wean." And so, uh, once again, you would refer this mother to the uh, roadmap to that four-month-old section, and this is what she would learn. A four to five-month-old is on the way to exciting motor and mental development. Notice this baby's determination, frustration, and then surprise by rolling over. In just a moment, the baby seems pleased with her accomplishment and is ready to explore the world from this new perspective. Rolling over often happens at the same time a baby becomes increasingly aware of her surroundings. See how she pulls right off the breast when she hears another voice? This distractibility is normal at this age. It is not a sign that the baby wants to wean. Instead, it's evidence of important mental development. Mothers learn that breastfeeding in a less stimulating environment often helps the baby settle down for her meal. Babies who are especially sensitive to developmental surges may be energized by these developmental changes and begin to awaken more at night. If a mother does not anticipate these changes, then she might think her baby is hungry and needs more nighttime calories. However, mothers who understand developmental surges can continue the breastfeeding pattern that was working before the changes began. Now is a good time to practice comforting your baby back to sleep without adding more nighttime feedings. Be sure to watch the Bumps in the Road video on this roadmap page. Hey. Now, uh, you probably all know that the guidelines for beginning solids have been changed from starting at four months to starting at six months. So when we get to that six month old, what kind of concerns does a mother have? Well, one thing is this is the exciting time when the baby is getting that first tooth and beginning solids. But you know what grandma might say, you better stop breastfeeding or you're gonna get bit. <laughs> so of course we want families to understand how to manage um, the latching of that six month old in a way that she won't get bitten. So here uh, we've got Yoko's family demonstrating for us this important information. Six months is an exciting time for you and your baby. Baby will get that first tooth and be ready for solids, also known as complementary foods. Don't worry about being bitten when you see that first tooth. If baby is properly latched, she cannot bite you. Just take her off the breast when she is tired, bored, or seems to have had enough to eat. It is important to know that a baby's intestines keep developing after birth. 
Breast milk contains a protective protein that coated the lining of the baby's bowel as it developed. This process is now complete. That's why many national and international organizations recommend beginning solids at about six months old. So of course it helps families to understand the reason for delaying solids to six months and they can learn that by uh, watching the roads map six month. Um, hey Jan, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm getting messages from somebody that the training is at capacity. They're trying to get in and they're unable to enter. Is that a thing you can help with? Um, not now. <laughs> there were only 100, reg uh, 95 registered this morning. So the capacity is 100, but I didn't know they were uh, going to go over that. So yeah, I'm making a recording of it. And um, Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. All right. Um, so we know at six months that a baby is ready uh, to eat when they stop having that tongue thrust, when they start imitating, grabbing the spoon, putting everything in their mouth, including their toes, and, and are sitting up really well. And we know that that this is such a great time to have fun with food, making a big mess, just putting a, a raincoat or <laughs> an old rag underneath the baby's high chair to take care of the wonderful exploring of uh, beginning solid foods. So what about the nine month old? The nine month old is a baby that is entering the stage of separation anxiety and as uh, object of uh, permanence develop. So this baby, oh no, my baby cries whenever I leave the room. And of course, if all of a sudden a baby is seemingly more upset, then the mother, often the mother is going to worry, oh, it must be my breast milk. And so what we understand is at the nine month old is having this surge in their cognitive ability that they understand that things go, that go away still exist in the world. A fun way to prove this is if you're sitting with a, a six month old and you're playing with a toy and you drop the toy, the six month old will hesitate a minute, but not look for the toy. Because a six month old thinks that's magic, that when you that when something goes away, it's kind of like gone from the world. Whereas a nine month old, if you drop the toy, the baby may hesitate a minute and then start looking around. And if that's the case, then we know that um, that the, the baby's worry when mom leaves the room that she wants her to come back because she understands she's still out there in the world. And so here is the video that helps us understand that the nine month old. Until about nine months, most babies live in the world where out of sight is out of mind. Beginning at about nine months of age, a child's play shows us how she is practicing the idea that things that go away still exist in the world. The twins delight in the magic of dropping a toy and watching grandmother retrieve it. Another baby giggles with gusto when her sister plays hide and seek or his father initiates a round of peekaboo. Though your baby is beginning to grasp the concept that things and people that go away still exist, he still does not understand the idea of time. Now, when you go to another room to grab a cup of tea, baby knows you are gone. He misses you and may start to cry. Though just last week, he loved being dropped off at daycare. Now he gets upset when you hand him to his daycare provider. Without understanding time, baby cannot figure out when or if you'll ever be back. These surprising behaviors are called separation anxiety, and they demonstrate the wonder of baby's developing brain. The vulnerability baby now feels may cause him to suddenly be more cautious around other people. Baby may get upset when a neighbor comes to visit or when he's taken to the doctor for a checkup. This stranger anxiety is evidence that he is developing as he should. We have discussed before that a sudden surge in baby's development can cause new bumps in the road. Let's hear how a mother experiences her baby's nine month surge in development. How did she act that was odd to you? She had been sleeping through the night and uh -huh. she started waking up one or two times throughout the night. Um, always want me. Yeah. And she would cry when she would, when I would leave the room, she would cry, I couldn't be 
Oh, out of her sight. Um, um, before that happened, that she was kind of kind of easygoing, and you mm -hmm. felt like it, life was kind of more predictable, and yeah. then all of a sudden life seemed kind of crazy again. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, a baby who had been sleeping at night may now become frightened and wake up more often. A baby who had been eating well may now be less predictable at mealtime. But don't worry, baby is not trying to give up breastfeeding. Because baby doesn't need more calories now, you can practice ways to comfort baby at night without introducing more nighttime feedings. A pat on the back, singing her favorite song, or a cuddle with dad can often settle baby back to sleep. If you need to or want to comfort baby with breastfeeding, you might consider limiting those feedings to only a few minutes. This will reduce the chance of baby developing a need for more nighttime calories. Baby will settle down again soon. The fact that baby wants you close all the time is a sign that the two of you have successfully bonded. Cuddle up and enjoy his special need for you right now. Continuing to play games like peekaboo and hide and seek helps baby better understand his world. Be patient and celebrate this bump in the road as proof that baby is developing the way he should and as another example of what a great parent you have become. Okay, so there's the nine-month-old, and then Roberto here is quick to tell us about one of the problems that they encounter with a, a one-year-old, one that 12-monther. She's on the go all the time, Roberto says, and we know that that baby who's learning to walk that that surge in development will cause some changes in that baby's eating and sleeping. That separation and stranger anxiety you noticed around nine months has probably calmed down. But just when you notice that baby is more predictable in her eating and sleeping, things start changing again. All of a sudden, baby is learning to walk. Walking is an important and powerful surge in baby's development. You will probably see her pull herself up in bed, but not be able to get back down. You will notice her grand attempts at walking. Her wide-based gait and holding her arms out stiffly help her keep her balance. She will lunge towards you with delight and won't mind if you tumble to the floor. Often, babies this age want to practice walking both day and night. This surge in development may temporarily disrupt babies eating and sleeping, and even cause her to seem grumpier than usual. As you learned before, these bumps in the road are proof that baby is developing as she should. Remember, if baby has been sleeping for longer periods at night, she does not now need more calories. As you learned at nine months, you can practice ways to comfort baby without introducing more nighttime feedings. A pat on the back, singing her favorite song, or a cuddle with dad can often settle baby back to sleep. If you need to or want to comfort baby with breastfeeding, you might consider limiting the feeding to only a few minutes. This will reduce the chance of baby developing a need for more nighttime calories. Breastfeeding will certainly continue to provide baby with both nourishment and comfort for months ahead. Now can be a good time to introduce a bedtime toy, sometimes called a lovey. If you hug and kiss the toy before giving it to baby, the toy will remind baby of your love and attention. Holding the lovey as you breastfeed during the day increases the ability of that special toy to help baby settle down at night. Can you believe it? Only 12 months ago, you welcomed your baby into this world. What a lovely journey you've had, learning to understand, care for, and breastfeed your baby. You have learned to look closely at baby's behavior, to consider how baby's development impacts this behavior, and to know when to ask for help navigating any bumps in the road. Celebrate all you have learned thus far as you continue traveling the road to breastfeeding and parenting success. I do think that the uh, one of the real goals of the Hug Your Baby program is to empower parents by giving them information because when they feel empowered, they will be, in fact be more successful parents and have a more rewarding experience as a family. And as far as those breastfeeding mothers, we want them all to feel like they are superheroes because what they have done, the, the, their struggles to learn how to breastfeed, their interest in their reading and studying to understand their baby's behavior. We want to celebrate with them the fact that they've done a fabulous job. So let's get back to that oh no story we started with, that four, mother with that four-month-old calling up one of the breastfeeding counselors. 
Do you think that means she wants to wean? Now let's return to this worried mother, the one who called you at 4 o'clock on Friday. Now you can easily send her a link to the Roadmap to Breastfeeding Success information and point out the video on the normal distractibility of a four-month-old. You can also show her where to read the four-month-old newsletter about a mother who faced this same problem. Oh, your baby's not ready to wean. Both you and your baby love breastfeeding. You just helped this mother meet her breastfeeding goals, and you did it in just a few minutes. So that's an example of how we hope that you will use these materials with the families you serve. And I, I see that a few couple of few questions have come in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to review the, the uh, feedback about our program that you gave us when you were taking the roadmap program. And then we'll get uh, I have a few minutes at the end for questions. So let's hear what Michigan has to say. Uh, you probably noticed uh, as part of your our program that we have um, give testing, both a pretest and a post test. And I do want to reinforce that your scores are private. Uh, we use that information to provide us feedback with what areas of our program we need to enhance. Um, and but we also the program was set up so that you would have the opportunity to review what you had learned. And in fact, some of you have noticed that if you missed a question, uh, you were able to go back and, and review that information and re retake the test if you didn't um, pass enough to, to pass the test and also uh, improve your ability to help others. We do also want to mention that that this information where I'm presenting now is what we call aggregate information. We put everyone's feedback, everyone's scores into one big pot, stirred it up and giving it back to you here. So none of your individual scores and information will be shared with um, the WIC leadership in any way. Okay, so the good news is that every single one of you passed the uh, post test. Well, that's because you had to pass it to pass the course. And, and if you struggled with some of the questions, you were able to go back and review your outline and, and, and pass the test. So when we looked at your, um, your knowledge about breastfeeding and baby's behavior. At the beginning of class, we, we think of a passing score being about 70. And at the beginning of our work, our um, two-hour uh, uh, roadmap course, y'all just eked over a little bit into about 72% uh, as a group. But by the end of the course, you were up to almost 90% real proof that you had increased your knowledge about baby's behavior. In the second group of information uh, that we collected from you was to get your evaluation of how you were um, teaching parents before the roadmap course, and then what were your plans? How did you plan to teach them information after the course? And the reason we asked this is there's really important uh, literature about the importance of intending to take action. There's a correlation between someone who says, I am going to start teaching my parents about deep and active sleep. In that situation, that individual is more likely to take the actions and to follow through on that. And so that's why we ask you about your behavior at the beginning of the course and then at the end of the course, we asked you a question. So for instance, before at the beginning of the course, we said, I currently teach parents about how a baby's body re reacts to overstimulation. And at the end of the course, we ask you, after taking this course, I plan to teach parents about how a baby's body reacts to overstimulation. And you may remember that you answered in one of four ways, even you said, strongly agree. Yes, sir, Re, I'm going to teach this. Agree, I am going to teach this. Well, disagree, no, 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 I don't think so. Or strongly disagree, I am not going to include this in my teaching. And what we wanted to look for is that our new favorite colors are blue and orange <laughs> because those are strongly agree and agree. So let's see what kind of feedback you gave us. Let's start with the first one. Before I teach, um, 
Uh, I currently teach parents about how a baby's body responds to overstimulation. You'll see that before the uh, course, there was about half of you did not teach parents about overstimulation. But after the class, all of you plan to teach about how the baby's body responds to overstimulation. How about normal increase of crying at a two week old? At the beginning of uh, the course, uh, about at least a third of you did not talk about increased crying at two weeks, but at the end of the course, all of you plan to include that teaching in your working with young families. How about telling parents the difference between active and deep sleep? Well, more than half of you at the beginning of the class did not routinely include that, but at the end of the course, all of you thought that was important and plan to refer patients to information about active and deep sleep. Now, an, another interesting question is, do you teach parents about how the baby's stools change at about the four to six week time period? Because of course, what we'd said before was, if parents don't know this ahead of time, they may assume that they have a breastfeeding problem. And about 25% of you were not including that at the uh, beginning of the course, but all of you plan to include that now. And about that really lovely distractibility of the, the, that four month old, that baby who pulls off the breast when the dog walks by or when the phone rings. Um, uh, again, about 25% were not including that, the gray color uh, before the class, but after the class, you all are planning to include that information. And then that separation anxiety, you know, I think that we, a lot of us kind of peter out on our breastfeeding information when the babies are around six months old. But I think you have understood from this course that if a parent misunderstands um, the separation anxiety that happens in a nine month old, if that baby starts waking up more at night, the mother's first thought is my breast milk is not strong enough. I better stop breastfeeding and use formula. And so uh, over half of you were not including that information initially, but now you've changed your mind about that. And similarly, walking, you know, that we know now that babies are going to have a disruption in their eating and sleeping when they start to walk. And three-fourths of you had not included that information, but more of you now are understanding that that would be important for families to understand about how the baby's learning to walk impacts that baby's uh, eating experience. Now, that, uh, so we talked about the knowledge and we talked about your kind of current teaching uh, information, but now we're also interested in your confidence. How confident do you feel in your ability, for instance, to identify signs of overstimulation? And we see that there was a real increase that you strongly agree now, the blue color at the end of the course that you can identify signs of overstimulation. What about, are you confident in helping to comfort a crying baby? Well, you know, we kind of figure that most of you, if you deal with babies at all, you need to be comfortable um, with helping a, uh, that crying baby. And in fact, most of you did uh, before, but even afterwards, more of you strongly agreed that it was important to help parents understand that and that you were confident in your ability to do that. And finally, how confident are you in, in being to identify active and light sleep? And uh, over 20%, 5% of you at the beginning of the course were not feeling confident, but all of you were feeling confident at the end of the course. And then it's important for your, um, your leadership in, in WIC to, to be sure that you are making taking advantage of the resources that are available to your parents. So at the beginning of the class, we ask you, do you refer clients to Michigan WIC's Mom to Mom Breastfeeding Support website page? And um, you know, over 25% of you were not doing that. Whereas now at the end of the course, you now have got the, um, the digital parent resource page, the Hug Your Baby page is gonna be a part of your mom-to-mom uh, uh, -mom breastfeeding support information. And so all of you changed your mind about that, made it more of a priority to share that information. 
And then just some general overviews. Um, uh, do you now intend to refer patients to the digital parent resource page? And you all uh, agree that you're interested in that. You did view the course as evidence-based. It's your opinion that um, this, this online approach to education was convenient and um, easy to follow. And finally, would you recommend uh, this training to other professionals who do the kind of work you do? And of course, I am very excited that all of you would recommend these uh, programs to others. Okay, so we're kind of winding down here. And before we finish, I want to um, uh, let you know about one more service that uh, uh, we have available. Um, we have in Hug Your Baby what we call a certified hug teacher. And uh, Margie and I have talked about uh, uh, having three or four of you in the state of Michigan uh, be able to become certified hug teachers. And what's involved in that is taking two more online courses uh, that are delivered in the same way as the course you took before that talk about the Hug Your Baby strategies and more information about successful teaching of parents. Um, and then the final uh, part of that program is uh, a, a, a course where you will actually document using the materials with some families. How did the families respond to that information? And um, uh, what experience did you have in sharing Hug Your Baby with families? And what, the reason we're interested in this, and we've begun this with um, our WIC programs around the country, is that we want someone in the state, we want a couple of people in the state that can help mentor others. You know, for instance, if, if someone says, you know, I can't remember how to get to the, the resource page, or I'm having trouble explaining to a mother how to, um, to access the roadmap. You know, you will have someone there who can mentor those in the state. Also to make sure that new staff coming on board, be sure that they access the Hug Your Baby training. And then the, finally, what we're really excited about is this fall, we're going to be getting together the certified hug teachers from the different WIC programs around the country and having just some um, kind of support brainstorming um, gatherings, maybe a couple of times a year to talk about the ways in which you're using Hug Your Baby within your state and, and learning from each other about ways to support and encourage the use of these materials. So I'm excited to offer this uh, training to, um, to WIC, um, uh, Michigan WIC, and um, Margie would just gonna be uh, asking that if any of you are interested in becoming a certified hug teacher, if you would email her, she will talk to you more specifically about the process to do that. And then finally, I want to let you know that I do teach a two hour uh, preparing for breastfeeding Zoom class that I want to invite any of you who are interested in to join me at, at no cost. This course is offered uh, once a month or every other month if it's busy time of year, when people on vacation or something. But I offer this at no cost to families all over the country. I began doing this during COVID and I, because I just thought it was so interesting that, um, that people were not accessing basic breastfeeding information during the pandemic. So I've had, it's just been such a joy for me to offer this that I've continued to offer this. And so if you are interested in joining uh, my class, all you do is go to our website, click down on, for, for parents under prenatal classes, and you'll see where you register for that, that class. Okay, well, we've talked about a lot, haven't we? Um, I'd like to share one final video that is um, I think captures my feeling about the work we do. What I have found in my 150 years of doing this kind of work <laughs> is that if I expect to be surprised, it makes my work so much more fun and enjoyable. And by expect to be surprised, what I'm thinking is that each encounter I have with a family, I'm thinking to myself, 
This is a special individual mother with a very special, unique baby. And so each encounter, whether it's over the phone, over Zoom, or in person, is an opportunity to be surprised by what I encounter. And I thought this art exhibit in Paris sort of captures the fact that sometimes we think we will encounter one thing, but in fact, we encounter something entirely different. So here we are just seeing a few uh, giraffe exhibit in Paris. But when we go around the corner, what happens to the giraffe? The giraffe turns into an elephant. How could that possibly be? I better go check that out again. I go back around the corner and that elephant has changed back into a giraffe. And the reason that I like this little video here is it reminds me if I always have preconceived ideas about what a family is gonna say to me, then I may miss the fact that it's not a giraffe, it is actually an elephant. I may miss what that family is really trying to communicate to me. So I just uh, allow myself to be surprised in those encounters as I get to know what is special and important to that family. So let's see, we will end here with the Hug Your Baby a lullaby that uh, celebrates the World Health Organization's uh, 10 Steps to Successful Breastfeeding. And then we'll have a few minutes left for some questions. Makes a mother's heart warm Born in a circle of caring Right from the start Babies win our heart In the first hour I get What my mom knows is best Sleeping by mother's hand I eat when I baby who's born makes a father's heart warm born in a circle of caring right from the start babies win Uh, finish with the final poll here. Um, if you would answer these, I'd appreciate it. If uh, this workshop increased my understanding of how a baby's development impacts the breastfeeding experience, do you strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree? This workshop motivates me to refer clients 
uh, to the Hug Your Baby Digital Parent Resource page. Do you strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree? And finally, I think the Hug Your Baby Digital Parent Resource page will help the mothers I serve meet their breastfeeding goals. Again, do you strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree? And we'll, I'll just keep that up for a minute in case um, uh, you're still working on that. It looks like most, most everybody's being able to um, uh, uh, answer that. That's great. So uh, I always like to um, end also by asking this question. We've got just five minutes here, I think. Uh, if, um, if any of you want to unmute yourself, and I always like to ask the question, where, what was an aha moment for you? What, um, what experience did you have today? What information did you come to today that you made, that made you think, I think the mamas I work with is, that's going to be really important. Would anybody unmute themselves and share that with us here? I would be happy to go first. Sure. Um, the whole time when I was doing the training leading up to this live training today, I was just raving about this and I'm not, you know, I've been in this job for four years and this is what, by far one of the best trainings that I have taken. Um, and it is like, it's one of these, it's one of the trainings that is very, very like, it's a game changer for me. Oh, um, wow. just having the tools that are like, okay, it's not just the same stuff. Like, okay, Yes, breastfeeding is super important, you know, but it's always, it's not just like, just nurse the baby, just nurse the baby, just nurse the baby. It's like, okay, yes, that is super important, but also it could be this, it could be this, you know what I mean? And all of the developmental stages, moms and families need to understand that too. And I just think that it'll just get, it'll just make our families feel so much more empowered. Um, and I wish that I knew this when I had my son, because it would have made me feel so much more empowered to yeah. raise my son. <laughs> so that's the way, that's the way I feel about it. This. I had my son too. I wish I'd known this too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I think, you know what I mean? I mean, it's kind of been a blessing of the pandemic that we use that time to put all this material in one place for your families to access because not all your families get to come to a training like this or you know have the opportunity to have the training that you had. So thank you for sharing that. Does anyone else want to share something? Got a few minutes more. I think I'll piggyback on basically what, what Ashley said. Um, I love the ease of the information, you know, and how to provide that because it basically covers like so many of the major issues that moms are gonna encounter throughout that whole first year. I just, I think this is so relevant mm -hmm. to the messages that we're passing along. And, and it's just great um, to have access to all of the evidence and the experience and, you know, it's, it, it, it really is us translating baby behaviors and, you know, letting moms know that they are, they are adequate. They are doing everything uh, right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I always tell everybody that I'm, when they ask what I do, I'm like, I'm a professional cheerleader. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> right. Oh, that's I'm a great. cheerleader. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested if some of you've had the experience that, mo that most of your lactation training has been, you know, more focused on those first couple of weeks of the importance of getting people, babies on the breast and getting them started breastfeeding. But um, for me, the, what's exciting to me about the work that I get to do is that we're talking about extending breastfeeding and the kinds of challenges over time that families might encounter. Thank, thank you, Anna. Anybody else want to share something? Good. And um, did anyone else have another a question they wanted to ask too? I wanted to share something with the group. Thank you. Thank you. I really um, love this uh, training as well. And I can see it enhancing 
um, my training skills as I deliver to the clients, I've already began using. Oh, Leslie, great. Information um, because, oh my God, like Ashley said, this was, this was a long time coming. I love the fact that it's like a one-stop shop right now. Yeah. And so um, I do, it, it has already begun to um, improve my level of counseling with the clients. And it's making me look very, very, very smart. Oh, I love that. That Thank is you. really true. That is really true. And Thank you know, you. we're, we're kind of laughing about that, Leslie, but actually... I'm going to, I've been doing this kind of work for, you know, 40 years now. And what I find is that when I'm able to, you know, show a family what I really know and understand about not their baby only in the moment, but what's going to happen later. And as Leslie says, then we, they, the parents think, oh, that's a really smart breastfeeding person there. Yeah. What happens is those families will return to us with the most amazing um, questions. Like I'll remember a time I, when I, I teach this class to um, residents and I say to those family doctor residents, you cannot afford not to know this information because did you know that good breastfeeding support helps to diagnose prostate cancer? <laughs> and they go, no, 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 it doesn't. I say, yes, it does. Because what happened was I had been working with this family, oh, you know, in just the care and the understanding of their baby. And about six months later, the mother calls and says, I told my, uh, my uh, father-in-law that he should call you and ask you about these peeing problems he's having and what he should do about it. <laughs> And sure enough, this grandpa needed to go see a urologist. And I said, well, you know, this is the kind of thing that a urologist can help you with. And that man had prostate cancer that was treated completely. And so it is not a joke to say that the care we provide on the front end, you know, in supporting and encouraging a family, it, it can have really long, wide and deep um, impact for years to come. So thank you, Leslie. I'm glad your parents know now how smart you are. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, time for one last question or comment. Hi, I just put in the chat that um, I'm just super excited to have these resources that we've been educating on for such a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really excited to be able to send them a link. Moms are very connected online that way, and they often look for those resources. And instead of using Google, we can point them in your direction. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, uh, Margie, do, do people know how to get to this link on your through your website now? Yeah, I put the link into the chat. And it's on the WIC breastfeeding. There's, it's on the client side and then also on the WIC provider breastfeeding for WIC staff on that staff education, client education side. So it's on two places on our website. Thank you. Good. I knew, mm -hmm. I knew it was there somewhere. <laughs> yep. Good. Well, it has been a great joy to be with you all today. And I, I hope you can tell by my enthusiasm that this is information that I I really do feel like our mamas and daddies deserve to have, and they are so blessed to have all of you to help them in a real personal way to meet their breastfeeding and their family goals. And um, I know they are as happy and grateful about that as, as I am. Um, I look forward to those of you who are interested in further uh, hug your baby training, talk to your leadership about that. I will be inviting you to our a um, uh, couple of times a year international hug your baby training and hope that some of you will join us there. We are, I am today making a, um, a recording of this. So probably by tomorrow, I'll send all of you a newsletter with a link uh, to recording if you have um friends who couldn't uh, be here today with, for the, for the um, Michigan WIC staff will make that available. Um, and then also to remind you that any of you who are interested are welcome to join me for my um, 
free hug your baby, uh, preparing for breastfeeding to our uh, course. And you get to that by going to the Hug Your Baby website under parents, prenatal classes, and you can just sign up. You, I know that you have a lot of prenatal classes for your families in Michigan, but if any of your families wanted to uh, attend uh, my class, they would be welcome to do that as well. So thank you so much for joining me today. And um, I look forward to hearing really great things from Michigan. <laughs> Uh, and if you, any of you have any special uh, questions or comments you want to send me, um, you can certainly send me the, the, to the uh, Hug Your Baby email. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, Jan and Dion, do you want to hang on for a second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Danica, you had a question about the sending us the roadmaps. Yes, I'm glad you saw it. I'm like, I'm not yeah. going to leave we yet. We already paid for it, and they've been on the website since uh, March. Oh, okay. Good yeah, and know. that's the link that I put into the chat. It's on uh, it's on the WIC MDHHS bread, uh, breastfeeding website. Okay, so we just order them through the website then? It's not. It's not a piece of paper that you order. Like oh. it's not a paper. It is like a link that you can send. Um, okay. You can also download the PDF and print it if you want to. Okay, very good. That's yeah. what I was curious about okay. as a handout and, um, you know, a resource for them to have, you know, tangible. Yeah. So. Th yeah, I suppose. I don't know. I hadn't even thought about having that. I'm kind of like a paper ninny. And I've also was thinking about the clinics being virtual, right. not actually being in person. I, so I never too, even thought about printing them. I like, I definitely like to send them links, but I'm thinking about our in-person breastfeeding classes, which we're starting mm -hmm. back up in okay. May. Yeah. Um, and adding that into our resources, mm -hmm. like we have a small packet that we provide yeah. So um, with the cofactive information and such. So that was what I was mostly interested in. Yeah. I think for now, um, just maybe printing them off yourselves. Okay. If you guys have the capacity to do that. Okay. And of course, you'd want to include like a little card or something with the URL to so they can access the whole page. Yeah. Yeah. We want yes. to turn them on to the whole page so that they can have all the resources there. Yeah. Yes, def most definitely. Yeah. But at least to get them that roadmap and, and let them know that there's that resource, that's a nice way to, to do that. And do we have permission to use the videos in our classes, like virtually? Yes. I mean, you could certainly just turn, put, I mean, I think that would be helpful to sort of let families know about what's available. So you could, if you, I'm sure you have the ability to just open a website page in your class. Yes and then just click on them. I, I'd love you to use it that way. Okay, I was just like wanting to incorporate in our into our virtual class, why choose breastfeeding? Yes. Um, you know, it says it all, so. Yeah, and you know, I, I, it's, I think that that would be kind of modeling for them about how that resource is, is, is there and available in the now and the long run, you know? So I'd love to see you use it that way. Agreed. I would. I think it would be a nice way to end our class, just to kind of tie everything together. Yeah, and let me just add too that um, if you any of you are connected with people who do research, I know that um, a couple of the WIC programs have got like connections with the schools of nursing nearby or something. If anyone is interested in doing a research project with how families are using the digital parent resource page, I'd love to to give you some ideas about that. So maybe some of you have some connections that way. We have a college right here in my town. I will oh, reach out to our nursing program. So yeah. that's a great suggestion. We also have um, a, a, a two hour program I developed for nursing schools that the nursing students can watch during their maternity or pediatric practice that includes a lot of this information. It's a little bit broader than just breastfeeding. Yeah. That's awesome. Good, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Great question. All right. If everyone's good, I'm gonna let you drop off so Dan and I can talk about y'all. Thanks, you guys. We appreciate <laughs> you providing it. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Good, good guys.